24 professors at Harvard University and an expert on innovation and organizational change. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've forgotten my notes. I need a note. Just one. Thank you very much. Great. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Henderson. I'm a professor at Harvard University, and I stand between you and the end of this meeting. So I plan to be brief, that I can promise, and I will try to be both funny and interesting. I cannot guarantee either, but I will do my best. So um, I want to begin by reminding us of just how important this meeting is, how rare it is for investors and firms to meet together in a Reg FD context to really focus on the long-term plans of firms. I myself am a director of two, uh, two large firms. One is a Fortune 200. So I spend a lot of time thinking about relationships with investors and how that conversation goes. And so often it focuses on quarterly earnings and the numbers. And that's for good reasons, because it's hard to talk about the long-term in a way that's credible and that can be measured. And what CECP is doing is building that conversation. I was really struck, for those of you who were in the room when the CEO of Active was talking, when one gentleman said, you know, I've been following you, and this is the third time I've seen you give this presentation, and oh my goodness, you followed through. So it's the ongoing conversation that's capable of building trust and really encouraging and supporting firms to focus on the long term. And I want to focus a little bit on why we want firms to focus on the long term. And I have really two ideas. The first is that firms that are purpose-driven, and by purpose-driven, I mean firms that have embedded the idea that they're really trying to do social good at the core of their strategies, there's very good reason to think that those firms will outperform. But you can't just announce you're purpose-driven. It takes time to make the investments that make that a really credible commitment. And the second idea I want to throw at you in the two minutes before you run out of the room is that these kinds of firms may have an enormously important role to play in shaping the way our institutions and our society evolve over the next 20 years. I'm about to publish a book called Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire, which essentially argues that unless we change what we're doing, we risk massive destabilization to our physical and social systems, and that purpose-driven firms are ideally positioned to be at the leading edge of reimagining capitalism. And the book should really be called getting back to the kind of capitalism we had in the 50s and 60s, only without the sexism and the racism, but that is focused on the long term and cares about the communities. Um, but I called it reimagining capitalism instead. So um, let me begin by talking about a little bit about purpose, performance, and change. So this is a puzzling fact that has kept economists very busy for about 20 years. And to cut straight to the chase, the fact is this. In every industry, on average, the 10% most productive firms are approximately twice as productive as the 10% least. That is, they take the same inputs and they produce twice the output. I'm a muckety-muck professor at Harvard, and I spent 20 years in windowless conference rooms trying to make this finding go away. We did not believe it. Nobody believed it. It must be a measurement error. So there's study after study controlling for the quality of the capital and where people were educated and the price cost margin in the market and mumble, mumble, mumble. This result has endured. And so now there's a big, big discussion about what's causing it because it's showing up in all kinds of places. As you may know, the top firms in every industry are pulling away from the lower firms. They're much more productive. They pay better. What the heck is going on? 
Well, so I'll tell you what's going on. It's no big mystery. What's going on is that there are some firms that are able to run genuine continuous improvement, that genuinely treat their employees with dignity and respect, that can run teams that work together well, that promote on the basis of performance, not just on the basis of quantitative metrics, but genuinely on the basis of performance. We know what this list of management practices is. And for those of you who are curious, we now have several, I was going to say several hundred papers, but at least 100 papers demonstrating quite conclusively their link to productivity. So the big mystery is, why doesn't everyone manage this way? So one of my favorite papers, which I'm not going to suggest you rush out and read, but feel free to do so, is about why it took General Motors 25 years to learn to imitate Toyota. I mean, Toyota was running rings around them. Everyone knew Toyota was running rings around them. And Toyota kept saying, the answer is, we build a culture of dignity and respect, and we have real purpose in this business. And GM said, yeah, 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 yeah. We're in this to make money and push down our costs. And the year that GM said, OK, OK, we know, trust us. We're really purpose driven. We're in it for the long term. You know how everyone looked at them. Like, we don't believe you. So I've come to believe, and I think there is good data to this effect, to suggest it's all about purpose. That purpose has a number of strong organizational effects, mostly linked to performance. Now, I am not arguing that purpose leads to outperformance. Notice I've been talking about purpose and productivity. I haven't been talking about purpose and financial returns. And in a moment, I'll show you that the, uh, the data linking purpose to financial returns is, in fact, quite weak. Um, and we'll play with that. But every blue arrow on this slide represents a series of studies exploring that link. And so we know that purpose leads to shared beliefs, to common identity, to shared values, to real authenticity, and that these have real effects on things like strategic alignment, how hard people work, whether there are high levels of trust in the organization, and whether there's intrinsic motivation. That is, do people do the work because they find it intrinsically interesting? And I think there's lots of evidence to believe that these firms are more productive and more innovative and sometimes more profitable, but certainly not less. So we know, and I think the ESG data demonstrates this fairly conclusively, that en masse, simply mumbling about purpose in a badly managed way, doesn't, in a not very well measured way, doesn't increase returns. But there's no evidence it reduces. So that's really key. And I want to come back to that. Um, this is a study by my colleagues, uh, George. Seraphim, Claudine Gartenberg, and Andrea Pratt are uh, using data from the Better Places to Work. They used 5 million employee level records, very good measures of purpose, and ran them against financial returns. No, uh, no strong outperformance here. However, if you divide the teams into two groups, those, who are those firms who have high camaraderie, this firm feels like a family, and those firms that have high strategic clarity, that is where the employees said, I understand the goals. I know where we're going. I know why we're doing this. One of these groups outperforms. So those of you who saw me do this this morning, you don't get to vote. But how many people think it's purpose and high camaraderie? That's what you want. That's what drives returns. I love working here. It's a great time. And how many people think it's, I understand the strategy. I know what the milestones are. I know what we're going. Well, yes, that would be right. It's purpose and strategic clarity. There's nothing wrong with treating people like family and running a purpose-driven firm. And in fact, that's probably much better for the world, and it won't lower your performance. But if you really want outperformance, the data strongly suggests you need it linked to the strategy. And that's why what you're doing today is so important. Because when you have the discipline of investors saying, well, yes, you tell me you care about the world. That's very nice. But could you tell me exactly what businesses you're going to go into and how you're going to do that and the money you're going to make? That's what drives performance. And I think ultimately that is what will change the world. 
Because let me take you to my second point, and I'm going to call it thinking about the big picture. So there's something about me you don't know, unless you took the trouble to look me up online, which seems unlikely. And that is that I spent the first 20 years of my life, of my professional career, interesting Freudian slip, the first 20 years of my professional career at MIT as the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management. Anyone remember them? <laughs> so that's what I did. I'm British, as you can probably tell. So early on in my career working for McKinsey, I became obsessed with why firms couldn't see that the world was changing and kept doing the same old thing nonetheless. So Clayton Christensen and I have this, had the same thesis advisor. Clay, whom we dearly miss, an amazing person, became the rich and famous one, but that's what we focused on, <laughs> is why is it that firms can't change? And I was the Eastman Kodak professor, and here's the thing. I think we're facing a major moment of change. You've all seen these statistics. Only 20% of the world's population say the system is working for them. 56% say capitalism in its current form is doing more harm than good. More than half of young Americans say they prefer socialism. Probably what they mean is they want decent health care, not state ownership of the means of production, but it's still not very cheerful making if you're into capitalism. Um, and notice many people asking CEOs to step up. Last week at Harvard, we ran a debate. The week before last at Harvard, we ran a debate where the question was, is capitalism broken? 990 first-year students got to vote. What percentage of that group do you think said, yes, capitalism is broken? Somebody's mumbling 90. This is the Harvard Business School. <laughs> These are students at HBS. 50% of them said, capitalism is broken. Something is going on, people, and it makes me super jumpy. Because I think capitalism is one of the great inventions of the human race, that it's created untold prosperity and freedom, and throwing it out the window is really a bad idea. But capitalism is essentially being blamed partly because it has, I don't know if you've noticed, a number of very severe side effects. Climate change would be the most obvious. But accelerating inequality, not caused by capitalism, but by the breakdown in institutions around capitalism, is a serious problem. So, yeah, trust, in, trust inequality is degenerating. Most people don't trust the elite. That would be us. They think we've been making out like bandits by strip mining the planet and pushing everyone else's wages down. And they're really angry. So I think we face a Kodak moment, <laughs> a world-scale Kodak moment. So for those of you who haven't seen this kind of curve before, so imagine Kodak starts at the bottom left-hand corner, and they, they, they haven't invented, they're just inventing consumer photography. They don't really know what they're doing. And then suddenly, wow, they invent consumer photography. The whole thing takes off. They make unbelievable amounts of money. But over time, it flattens out. and someone goes and invents digital photography. And that's a problem. And it's complete coincidence that I moved to Harvard the year Kodak went bankrupt. Complete, complete <laughs> coincidence. But if you think about where we are at the moment, we're in a world that for years, business people assumed that natural and social capital were free. That you didn't have to worry about clean water or an ocean that was full of fish or the nature of the atmosphere, that wasn't business's job. Similarly, you didn't have to worry about education or healthcare. Somebody else worried about that. And we're moving to a world in which natural and social capital are expensive. And many people think that business should step up and deal with these problems. And that's a huge transition. And the reason I think business is so important is twofold. The first is that the other institutions that could help us make this transition are severely weakened. The very side effects that the last 50 years have brought us have lowered trust in government and created enormous partisanship. I know uh, political scientists who think our society may be on the edge of radical rupture. 
serious, serious problems. So I wanted to quote from you a, uh, a piece from the Harvard Business Review. This is by Scott LaPierre, who reviewed five books about finance and the future and how you should think about the world. And here, his, here is his opening quote. The working title of this article went from the chirpy fixing capitalism to the slightly panicked can capitalism be fixed to the downright baroque capitalism sure is better fix itself because no one else can so here are some last ditch ideas. <laughs> well, I'm more cheerful than Scott because I think firms are good at change. And in particular, I think purpose-driven firms are ideally suited to make this transition. And we saw some firms today who were exactly leading the way to a world in which you have to pay attention to these externalities and public goods. So if you think what uh, Welltower is doing, um, you know, Tom is saying, so we have all these social determinants of health, which everyone assumed was a public goods problem, and we're not quite sure how to deal with them, and nobody could make money dealing with that, and he's built a business which is giving his shareholders, he hopes, a more than 10% rate of return. I love that, because it's sustainable, it's economically sustainable, he can do it at scale. You saw that in the case of um, Active, where it's all about green, connected, and safe. So embedding these ideas in the core of the business. And here's the thing. All the CEOs stood up in front of you and made it look easy. Except I, I was fascinated by the uh, Philip Morris transition, where he was really talking about quite how hard that was. If he's talking in public about quite how hard that is, I'm pretty sure it's like way harder than he's saying. <laughs> these transitions are super hard. I spent 20 years as the Eastman Kodak professor. Really transforming organizations is really, really hard. We have to do it at scale in the next 20 years and really transform the society. And the thing I think I learned in 20 years of working on this problem is that purpose is what makes the difference. If your people really want to change, you can see levels of energy and productivity and creativity that we spent 20 years in the economics rooms trying to make go away from the data, but they are there. Change is super hard. We say it's not happening. We say we won't make any money. We say we can't get it done. But purpose can help. Thank you very much. Here? Yeah, there's my coming right now. Mm -hmm. okay. That was wonderful. Thank you. And um, I'm curious in these, we actually work with Eastman Kodak and predicted that they, or asked them, begged them to go to digital and they fired us. We were the last consulting company in. So, but I'm wondering if you think women are better at this than men, or you don't want to go there, it's okay. No, I'm happy to go there. Um, so I teach a course called, or I used to teach a course called Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems at HBS. We started out with 28 students and now we have 300 in the course. And I've been invited to take over one of the first year required courses and bring these ideas in. So the sort of center of the course is, you know, you can change the world and make money, and by the way, changing the world would be really a good thing. And now I'm going to generalize horribly. So all the men in the room, please forgive me. I'm talking about mean versus variance. But the women come up to me and go, yeah, right, where do we go? And the men come up to me and they say, are you sure? Like, about how much money? So as a first pass generalization. Um, but I think, you know, the answer lies somewhere in the middle. You need the passion that many people of the female persuasion have about what's happening. But it has to be married to the, let's really be careful about the money here, because the last thing we want is a lot of kind of soft hand-waving. Again, that, let me bring that back to why CECP is so important, is we have to marry the two sides of ourselves, you know, the kind of modal feminine, the modal masculine, whatever that is. So passion and focus. 
And of course, forgive me, I'm talking about mean and variance. Many women totally focused on the numbers, many men totally focused on the long term and the passion. Um, but to a first approximation, I think that's what we need to do. Do we have any more from in here? One from our watchers. How do companies assess whether their purpose is strong, if they have a purpose at all? <laughs> um, so after you've been working on it for about five or six years, you can run a good survey and see if everybody understands the purpose. But in the beginning, it starts with a group of senior people looking at each other and saying, so what are we doing this business for after all? And you have a pretty good sense of whether that's strong and you build it in the small group. And then, I mean, I can tell you there are at least 15 experienced CEOs in this room who have lived this. And then you talk about it and roll it out and make the expensive decisions that you only make because you have the purpose. And uh, every strong purpose-driven firm I'm in, that's like the core of the firm. Asking whether you know it is strong is, again, if you're continually reinforcing it. But, but you can measure it. You can measure um, it. And we have time for maybe one more, because I actually have one myself. <laughs> How would you distinguish purpose from the more traditional term of responsibility as it relates to corporate sustainability? Mm -hmm. So I think responsibility is important. Responsibility says I mustn't have human rights violation in my supply chain. It says I should begin to offset my emissions. There are all kinds of things we do because we're a responsible corporate citizen, and they're super important. But that's very different from my purpose is to transform the, auto the transportation business or my purpose is to make sure that we go from 20% of the population in decent elder care to 80%. The purpose is at the heart of the strategy. Responsibility is about being careful about how you get there. So we have time for maybe oh, one more from our room over here. So Vince Forlenza, CEO of BD. You talked about purpose. Hello, Vince. And hello, good to see you, Rebecca. <laughs> Uh, you talked about purpose, strategic clarity. Have you done research on empowerment and how that fits into those? Sure. That, that's, do you remember the diagram with all the blue arrows? Yes. Yes, so it's in that diagram. So very good data that if you can delegate authority in an atmosphere of trust and accountability and authenticity, performance increases enormously. And that can only be built slowly and gradually over time, but lots of good data to suggest you get more innovation and more productivity. And again, happier people with better lives. I mean, treating people with dignity and respect shouldn't be like a crazy idea, but you know, it makes all kinds of difference. I think, you know, I'm tempted to put you on the spot, but I won't. Like, why is that so hard? Why do so many firms not go down that road? But you know, it's an opportunity for competitive advantage. So that's the note we have to end on, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, before you all leave, I hope that you'll fill out your blue feedback forms that are inside your envelopes for the CECP so they can expand on the thoughts of what you got out of this as well. I was thrilled to hear such a wide range of topics being discussed. I know us at Bloomberg are focused on all of them as well, so hope to keep in touch. I, outside, you have the reception, and you'll hear from Nandika Madgav, Madgav, Madavkar, sorry, uh, the, senior director, the senior director of the CECP, and Doug Conant, uh, who has a soft launch of his book, and he is also the former CEO of Campbell Soup. Hope to see you all out there. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>